I will prevent and very easily World War III, very easily. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, I will have the disastrous war between Russia and Ukraine settled. It will be settled quickly. Quickly. I will get the problem solved and I will get it solved in rapid order. And it will take me no longer than one day. I know exactly what to say to each of them. I got along with very well with them. Hi, everyone. Neil Patterson here with the Sky News Daily. And that, of course, was Donald Trump, who has made it pretty clear on many occasions that he wants a speedier resolution to Russia's war with Ukraine. We are now learning the names of those he'll be appointing to key positions within his administration. So today we are asking what a Trump presidency means for Ukraine. Later, we'll be heading to Washington. Uh, But let's start in eastern Ukraine, where we'll find our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey. Stuart, you've been out there on the front line. Just give us a flavour of what you've been seeing. For the civilian population, this is a very difficult time. Uh, The air raid sirens are almost constant in all the big cities that we go to, and even in some of the just larger towns as well. So that is difficult for them. What has changed is the Russians are now sending much larger numbers of drones at the same time. And that is a mixture of drones, which are basically decoy drones. They don't have any weapons on them. And then uh, drones uh, that are that are laden um, with explosives that have been uh, pre-programmed targets, which they fly to, but not in a necessarily a direct line. They, they zigzag. And so the air defense teams that we're with have to just try and follow those drones the best they can uh, with with radar and then take them out as they pass. One of the really big issues that uh, that all of the soldiers that we've spoken to have talked about is the lack of infantry. So they, they're short of everything, right? They're short of all the big weapons they need. They're short of the tanks that they need, but they can sort of survive. What they're really critically short of is actual infantry, uh, boots on the ground. People have left the country, obviously. A lot of young people are unwilling to fight and are trying to dodge the draft. And, of course, this is where Russia may not have had a particularly good fighting force, though it's definitely improved. It's just its weight of numbers is huge. And it was always going to be difficult for Ukraine to resist this. Stuart, to describe the effect that those drones that managed to get through Ukraine's air defences actually have when they when they land? The large ones that are, that are packed with explosives can can destroy houses for certain, can certainly take out top floors uh, of apartment blocks and, as a result, kill people uh, beneath it. And also, really critically, can go after these power plants, etc., and can knock them out or certainly damage them significantly. It is effective at bringing the war into Ukraine. But it's also psychological because you can hear them all the time. And that is it's a strange noise. It's a drone. And you can hear that droning noise. And that has a massive effect on the civilian population. Obviously, it's not just drones that are coming through. It's um, rockets as well. And these are devastating. I mean, these will take out whole apartment blocks and kill large numbers of people. We know of apartment blocks. We know of hospitals that have been hit as well. This has happened over the last, well, many months now. And uh, there's nothing to indicate that that is going to stop. How sophisticated then are Ukraine's air defences, the air defences that you you are standing alongside, watching in in action. Many countries have had to actually take on the drone uh, war, find it difficult. Even places like Israel, with incredible air defence systems, finds it difficult uh, to deal with drones. And the Ukrainians, interestingly, have sort of reverted back to old Soviet era, Cold War era, anti-aircraft guns, which we were with, firing into the skies as they try to track. So you've got this really interesting bit where you have modern technology and a new type of warfare that is sort of colliding, if you like, with very old-fashioned, just shoot in the air and see if you can take it out of the skies. What we didn't realise when we first joined uh, the uh, teams that we were with is that while we would be in a field with this old gun firing up into the, into the skies, it was actually 
everywhere around us and in, in, far into the distance, we could see the tracers from other units doing exactly the same thing. So there's almost, it's pretty well organized, pretty well coordinated. And it's, if you like, a, an enormous line of these cannons firing into the sky at the various drones as they pass by. And everyone we spoke to was very motivated. It's, they, 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 they take it actually quite personally. And as, as the commander was telling me, I asked him very much, do you actually worry about when the drones go by? He said, like, every one of those that we don't hit, I think of my family because our family and our friends are somewhere where they may land. And I think that's actually something that the Ukrainian military has has shown throughout all of this conflict, is that they are there defending their country, which, of course, gives them an awful lot of strength. It almost sounds like Ukraine is losing this particular battle, and I'm wondering what that means for the overall war. Ultimately, it is about territorial gains for Russia that will actually change or otherwise the the way that this war goes. The effect on the civilian population by the continuous bombing, the continuous drones is significant. A lot of families have lost loved ones and definitely there is a fatigue. However, the overwhelming sense you get is that people believe they have to they have to keep on fighting. So I think that that effect for the Russians has failed. However, militarily, which is what this is going to be about, territorial taking of land, the Russians are definitely of the upper hand at the moment because they have pretty much unlimited supplies of infantry and pretty much unlimited supplies of weaponry, especially when you have countries like North Korea and Iran helping Russia. And it is somewhat ironic, isn't it, is that we find ourselves in a position where Russia and its allies are more united and are getting closer than they've ever been whereas Ukraine's allies seem more and more divided about how much they can do. And, of course, with the future President Trump being something of a wild card and nobody quite sure what his position on Ukraine is going to be. Well, have you detected any change in morale, change in Ukrainian confidence as a result of that pending shift in administration in Washington? My impression is that morale amongst the soldiers remains high, and I think that is because... They are defending their country. That's the impression I got from the units we were talking to. Whether they're optimistic and whether they think that there's going to be good outcomes in that, I'd say probably not. And a few of them I've spoken to are definitely down in the mouth about where this is going to go. Again, often coming back to that issue of infantry because they just can't hold on if you don't have enough men. But what are people making of, of, of the individual appointments? Because it's not just, of course, the, the president that has changed, but it's also Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, and a Secretary of Defence that I'm reliably informed is a Fox News host. A Fox and Friends presenter, that's the morning show. Um, I think it's worth remembering that the president of Ukraine was a stand-up comic and it's why he became famous in the first place, playing a president. So I think the Ukrainian people are quite capable of dealing with whoever uh, Donald Trump chooses to put in positions of authority, regardless of whether they are just a TV presenter or not. Though I think it did come as a bit of a shock that it would actually be a, a Fox and Friends presenter to become possibly one of, after the president, one of the most powerful people in the world. I just wonder, when you are seeing these kind of wholesale changes take place, that the personalities, that the, the, the boss class, the officers, the president himself are, are, are dealing with, they must have a degree of uncertainty as to whether the taps will ultimately be turned off. And if the taps are turned off by the United States, what effect will that have? Well, well, if the taps are turned off, that is it. I mean, it's game over. They can't survive without the, the United States. There are others here who be saying, well, hold on, Trump has said he wants to end this and he, he would in a day and that he wouldn't have let it start in the first place. So, and some of those picks that are, that are being mentioned for his new government have been pretty strong on supporting Ukraine. There's been a variety of political, technical reasons why they haven't necessarily supported funding. But it's not that they don't believe in funding Ukraine. They just wanted money to be spent in other issues in the United States. It's just the amount of, of a gear that they, they need and the amount of money they need is down to the United States. I don't believe that the European nations gathering together would be actually uh, able to change the course of history if the United States uh, was to step away and turn off the tap. 
and we'll have much more on Trump's key appointments after this. Welcome back. Now, we are certainly learning a lot more about the shape that the next Trump presidency will take. Uh, we've been hearing the names of those he'll be appointing to some senior positions, many of whom, of course, will have a direct effect on that war in Ukraine. Our US correspondent, James Matthews, joins us again from Washington, D.C. Good to see you, James. Uh, well, look, we are, we are beginning to hear some of the names uh, that are emerging, additions to the Donald Trump administration. Uh, in fact, we were just talking about this one uh, with Stuart Ramsey just a moment ago. The choice of Secretary of Defence, Pete Hegseth, an interesting one. Yes, admittedly, a National Guard captain, but currently a Fox News host. Explain. Yeah, that's right. It's raising eyebrows and dropping jaws. Pete Hesketh, uh, he is formerly in the National Guard, so he does have a, a military background. But you're right, he's a weekend presenter on Fox News and Bridges News and Light Entertainment. Uh, he's interviewed Donald Trump several times. I have to say, not the toughest probing that Donald Trump will ever have endured. A view that I'm seeing widely articulated here is that uh, he's been appointed as a yes man who will do Trump's bidding. In terms of Ukraine, there will be concerns in Kyiv, I imagine, about uh, his experience, his lack of engagement with them and their interests. The voice will be Trump's voice in Pete Hesketh's ear. In terms of the other personnel, Senator Marco Rubio, Trump's pick as Secretary of State, Mike Walsh as National Security Advisor, both from the traditionalist wing of the Republican Party. Ukraine-wise, they are appointments that I think play into the urgency of finding a solution. Waltz was quoted recently talking about the US uh, urgently needing to bring an end to conflict in the Middle East and Ukraine so that it can shift strategies to where it should be the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. Rubio, he was pro-Ukraine for a long time, but there might be some cause for concern in Kyiv. He was part of the Republican resistance in Congress against a new round of funding earlier this year. That, of course, was at a time when there was a, a president who dragged the funding bill, kicking and screaming to get it done. Big support from Joe Biden at the time. That clearly is not necessarily the, the case now. Marco Rubio strikes me as, a, as an interesting choice uh, for Secretary of State, the United States' highest diplomat, ultimately, Foreign Secretary, we'd call them, in, in this country. Given the fact that for a, quite a while, wasn't he the target of Donald Trump's ire and insults? He used to call him Little Marco, didn't he? Yeah, of course, they were rivals to be the Republicans' pick uh, in the 2016 election. Trump called him Little Marco. Uh, Marco Rubio repaid Trump in kind with the insults, talking about the... Uh, size of his hands and so on, if you know uh, what I mean. We saw in his first term that that revolving door of hires and fires. I suppose the difference this time uh, is that, you know, in 2016, he didn't, he didn't expect to win the election. There was a rush to engage in that process of government and team selection. Ultimately, he picked people who, who disagreed with him and stood up to him. And that, of course, ended in tears. This time it's different. He's seen this coming, and we see ourselves the foresight in his picks. The lesson he's learned is in choosing loyalty, loyalty to him. James, I, I'm sitting here scratching my head with my massive hand, uh, wondering exactly why, when we look at these three key positions, SecDef Pete Hegseth, Secretary of State Marco Rubio, and, of course, the National Security Advisor Mike Waltz, when you look at the foreign policy interventions that they have made, they all seem to be rather more focused on the threat from China rather than the extant, the ongoing war that is taking place on the eastern frontier of Europe. And, and I'm just wondering why that might be. Donald Trump clearly sees China as the, the main threat. And I think that's why we see the personnel choices that we've seen in the past couple of days. Rubio and Waltz in particular are viewed very much as China hawks. And I think their appointment will increase the tension between Washington and Beijing. Rubio in the past, he's been sanctioned by China, has been quoted as saying China is the threat that will define this century. I think China and the way that relations play out between Washington and Beijing will define very much the Trump administration and how it gets to grips with what it sees as the principal threat. 
I think it's arguable that the Republican Party is a narrower church when it comes to foreign policy positions than, than in the past. So I'm wondering, is there anyone within the party willing to stand up to the incoming president on the issue of Ukraine? There clearly is a body of opinion that has backed Joe Biden in his effort to increase funding. But there are also uh, loud voices, very vocal opposition to continuing to fund the Ukrainian war effort. And that is backed increasingly by a public mood that has drifted away in the United States from Ukrainian interests. Poll after poll uh, indicates there is a substantial number of people who see this as a distant war that is irrelevant to their lives and some distance from their uh, primary domestic focus. So that is the difficulty for Ukraine, principally, and for Donald Trump, should he continue to support their war effort. It is in carrying the political mood with them. We're learning more and more over the days about how Donald Trump will put together his, his administration. A number of other names have been mentioned. Stephen Whitcoff heading off as Middle East envoy. He was a, a New York-based real estate mogul. You've got the former governor, Mike Huckabee, uh, heading off to be the US ambassador to Israel and, and Elon Musk as well. But I suppose the one thing that every appointee to a Donald Trump administration will have in the back of their minds is, look at the last time, if Donald Trump doesn't like you, you're heading for the door. And that can happen within a matter of days as well, can't it? Donald Trump isn't a man who hard and fired on TV only. I mean, we saw in his first administration uh, that revolving door of people who, who simply didn't cut it in his eyes. The reality was that they simply had principles of their own and stood up to him. Uh, and that didn't work for Donald Trump. This time, he has seen it coming. So has lined up the individuals who he feels could work for him. Interestingly, in Mar-a-Lago, as he sifts through the possibilities, uh, we're led to believe that there has been almost a situation room where names will come up, and if he asks for detail, then they provide him with a video presentation of that, cert that particular individual. Part of the presentation is about their performance on TV. He watches interviews and so on. So, you know, the performance clearly very important to Donald Trump, but above all, uh, it is loyalty and you look at the names he has chosen thus far and each one of them screams loyalty. The people in the Trump tent right now are people on his side. I think if you watch the interviews conducted by Pete Hesketh, uh, you might form that view. It's all, all been very much about uh, providing Donald Trump with a platform to say what he wants to say and to say what he thinks. If that is the kind of relationship that we will see between those two individuals, between President and possible future Secretary of State for Defence, then clearly this is Trump's world and uh, we are all existing in it. And you can hear much more from James in Washington and, of course, Stuart Ramsey in Ukraine. Just head to the website, skynews.com. The Daily will be back again, same time tomorrow. We'll see you then.